I am grateful to the Rule of Law Development Foundation for the privilege of participating in this conference. I am even more grateful for the opportunity of addressing this subject relating to the multiplicity of our criminal laws and the debates over their harmonization. Let me start by saying that there is no shortage of knowledge concerning these matters. We never stop thinking about them. We never stop talking about them. We have written so much on this subject. For a nation whose people are as intelligent as we are, you may be certain that there is a large body of knowledge about these matters. Even though we have for many years now been stigmatized as a corrupt nation, the reason we continue to survive as such is because we are a hardworking, intelligent, patient, and resilient people. Nevertheless, while we are definitely not short of ideas, we have fallen short in the area of action. It is not enough to have good ideas. Good ideas are of no use if not put into action. It is not enough to have good laws. We must also have good men and women to implement them. If we do not implement the laws, the tendency will always be to blame the laws for our inadequacies. And that is why it is said that the more laws, the more crime. With the advent of civil rule in 1999, at a time when corruption had permeated every department of our national life, we went from one extreme of dictatorship to the other extreme of liberalism. When you are under a dictatorship, you are not under law. You are under the rule of the dictator. And dictatorship never takes root until corruption has taken root and permeated every part and every individual. At that time, there were laws, just as there are even now, but they were never enforced. The will of the dictator prevailed. With the adoption of the presidential system of government and the vesting of all power in one man, the president, you can say that we are still under a dictatorship. The only difference is that this time it is a dictatorship under the Constitution. The essence of this dictatorship under the Constitution is that all executive power so vested should be exercised to bind a nation with divisive tendencies. I do not know if the nation is more united today under the presidential system of government than it was in the past. This vesting of all executive power in one man extends to the states where all executive power is vested in the governors. In some of the states, it is said that the structures for accountability have been destroyed, with the result that the governors of those states are not accountable. In such states, there are said to be only two arms of government, the executive and the judiciary. The legislatures in, in, in those states are said to have been assimilated by the executive. As for local government, they do not exist as a tier of government. Why do I make these remarks? Because these are the factors responsible for the upsurge of crime and the consequent proliferation of the laws. And so it seems to me that an appropriate starting point in our discussion of the multiplicity of criminal laws is an examination of the reasons for unrelenting upsurge in crime. Our ancestors did not have a police force, 
such as we now have. They did not have an army such as we now have. They did not have prisons of the type and number that we now have. They did not have a judiciary such as we now have, but they enjoyed far more peace and security than we can even dream of. And why was it so? Because their laws were a product of their experience. Their laws were a product of their culture and consciousness. The laws that governed their affairs grew with them. Their laws were not imposed upon them by foreign powers, such as was the case when we were under colonial rule. To a large extent, those laws enacted by our colonial masters are the laws still in force today. We have never been able to adapt them to suit local circumstances. Our ancestors did not suffer from an inferiority complex such as many of us in positions of authority suffer from now. They were not a divided people with Christians killing Muslims and Muslims killing Christians as is happening today. They did not divide the nation into several bits and institute rigid boundaries so that indigents of one state could not find employment in states <coughs> except in states of their own. They did not appoint unqualified people into high offices as we have been doing for so long now. Government in their time was not based on patronage as it is now. They did not give their young the kind of theoretical education that we are giving to our young now. Education that makes them proud and distant from the community and does not make them self-reliant or equip them for the duties of life. This is why our ancestors enjoyed the peace and security that we are not even able to dream of. But what have we done today? We cast away completely the laws bequeathed to us by our ancestors. One of the greatest tragedies that has befallen our country is the fact that we idolize the ancestors of other nations while looking down on our own ancestors as barbarians. We must feel shame that we bear foreign names, eat foreign foods, and wear foreign clothes. We have taken upon ourselves foreign laws and made no efforts, as I said before, to harmonize them to suit local circumstances. On the contrary, we exploit the weaknesses in these foreign laws in aid of our criminality. We never stop amending our criminal procedure laws, but those who wish to exploit the loopholes in these laws always find a way around them. It is no surprise then that we are not doing well. In our approach to solving the problem, we appear to have imitated the Almighty God who started by giving our first parents just one law to govern their lives. The forbidden fruit was edible, but it was forbidden. They were told not to eat it. They proceeded to eat it. The Lord then imposed Ten Commandments in place of the One. We are proceeding in exactly the same way. In the past, we had very few criminal laws. As these laws were disobeyed, we multiplied them. The same with the rules that govern our criminal procedure. They have become more numerous and more complicated with time. We make more laws. And when those laws fail to solve the problem, we make even more laws. The question arises, because of the notion now gaining ground that we have too many laws and institutions for the prosecution and punishment of crime. But is that really so? In a nation of over 220 million people, do we have enough policemen and women? I do not think so. As at 1999, 
the nation had a police force of about 130,000 men and women. In eight years, the government was able to double that number. But what about training them? What about educating them? What about paying them the appropriate wages? What about providing them accommodation? What about equipping them? We expose our policemen and women to many situations over which they can do nothing. They work under the most inhuman conditions, resisting crime with their bare hands. In the end, their minds are brutalized and we proceed to condemn them when they disappoint our expectations. The same with our judges. We have too few courts and too few judges. The judiciary is founded on the premise that the work of the courts will be limited. If that work becomes unlimited, the judges, however honest or hardworking they are, cannot cope. After a while, they become indifferent, and then we condemn them. I will say nothing of the great temptations that we heap on the judici judiciary and expect them to resist when for over 20 years, judges and justices have been on the same salary. As earlier stated, the crime rate in the nation has in increased. Major crimes such as kidnapping, murder, burglary, fraud, terrorism, and so forth are on the increase. But I, 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 I want to stop at this point because, as I said, my remarks are merely going to be introductory to the presentation that my brother J.B. Daudu is going to make. But I, I want to make this appeal to the nation, and I make it to those in authority. If we go on committing crimes, and government is the source of crime, it's true. The crimes that inst institutions like the EFCC, the IP, uh, ICPC are called upon to uh, uh, contend with are coming from the government. It is not in enough to make more laws. We must correct ourselves. Right now we are dealing with the elections. We must restrain ourselves. We must ensure some discipline in our conduct. Otherwise, no matter how many the laws are, if we don't have good people to enforce them, the laws are not self-enforcing. Self they need good people to enforce them. So why, why don't we have good people? We, we do have good people, as I said before. We are a nation of good people. But unfortunately, the people in, in leadership, the people holding offices, are not our best because we are running a government of patronage. From, from 1968, from 1967, when we multiplied institutions, multiplied the states, we met the needs that arose by appointing unqualified people into high offices. And that's what's going on right now. The boundaries of the states are rigid. And so, a man, no matter how qualified, cannot find employment in states other than their own. These are the real problems that we have. The institutions for law enforcement are inefficient. And so you find that the, those institutions that are perceived as efficient become congested, like the EFCC. People are taking to EFCC cases which are not the, 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 the type of cases for which they were founded. But let me leave it at that.